Yeah. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. I would like to welcome you to the uh, e-workshop Contribution of Sustainable Biomass and Bioenergy in Industry trans Transitions Toward a Circular Economy. Today, we have session two, Biomass and Energy Intensive Industry, Steel and Cement Sectors. Um, we are very happy to have again a strong interest in this workshop and just to uh, uh, information on how to particip participate we have the um, chat where you can just exchange information between the participants and we have the q a um, window where you can uh, put a specific question to the different presenters my name is uh, Daniela Train. I'm greeting you from Germany, from Leipzig, and I will uh, lead you through the session together with Paul Bennett from New Zealand. Maybe, Paul, you can say two words about you. Uh, good morning, good evening, or wherever you may be. Um, my name is Paul Bennett. I work for Scion in New Zealand, which is a government-owned research centre. Um, my role is uh, leading a team around clean technologies, which includes bioenergy. Um, and for my sins, I'm also a vice chair, the current vice chair of IEA Bioenergy. Thank you, Dan Daniela. Yeah, thank you very much, Paul. And um... With this um, information, I would like to give you a short introduction into the agenda. We have uh, six speakers giving about 10 minutes presentation each. And uh, it is um, uh, uh, covering all aspects of biomass and steel industry in different metallurgic coal in, and also in cement industries and uh, industrial kilns. Um, we will have a, a short uh, possibility to have one or two questions after the presentation and uh, uh, moderated in question and answers at the second part of the workshop. And we will have, as you might also have seen it yesterday, an additional Slido uh, activity, uh, which uh, allows us also to get, get your feedback and your opinions in a very nice condensed way. And for this Slido activities, I would like to hand over to Luc. Okay, thank you, Daniela. Um, let me share my screen. Is it visible? Yes. Okay, thank you. So also from my side, uh, welcome everybody. Uh, my name is Luc Pelikmans. I'm a technical coordinator uh, of IEA Bioenergy, Bioenergy. And I was also responsible for uh, producing this program, which was first, uh, first uh, destined to be a physical workshop in Lyon, but we were kind of forced to do it in other ways. So now trying this experiment to, to have it online uh, as a workshop, but also have some interactive um, session and, and uh, exchange with the audience. So I'd like to introduce you to Slido. Uh, maybe the people who were in the session yesterday already had some experience in it, but uh, maybe some people are new. So it's pretty easy to go to. So just uh, open slido.com uh, in parallel or just take your smartphone. That's also possible. Uh, type in slido.com and you will automatically, automatically come into the app of Slido. Uh, and then you can type uh, Q988 uh, as an entrance code. And I will now launch the first poll. So we will have three polls in this session. And um, at the end, during the Q&A, I will also set up uh, the central questions where you can also give your opinion. So uh, we'll just start with, uh, with the first poll uh, that you can start filling. And I see that uh, some people have already found it. Um, and the question is, when should global steel and cement facilities reach carbon neutrality? So to your opinion, what should be the aim uh, for these sectors to, to uh, be carbon neutral? Is that by 2040, 2050, uh, 20, 
I see that 70 and, and 60 are now reversed, so 2060, 2070. Or to your opinion, um, it's not needed for the sectors to reach uh, carbon neutrality and, and other sectors should compensate for what's remaining in these sectors. So I see that uh, votes are coming in. We're now at uh, 39 votes. Um, there's a slight majority going for 2050, uh, a bit less for 2040, but um, it seems that most people feel that by the next 20, 30 years, that this sector also needs to reach carbon neutrality. Okay, I will leave this uh, this open, this poll. So uh, you can still go to slido.com uh, with the access code uh, Q988. This access code uh, will remain the same uh, for the entire session. Um, I will give it back and then uh, when, we, when we come to the next poll, which is uh, after the uh, third presentation, I think, uh, you will see the final results of, uh, of this question. So I will stop sharing. Yeah, thank you very much, Luke. Maybe you can put the uh, access in the um, chat so people have the chance to uh, join. And uh, yeah, I think these are good news to see that there's a, uh, an expectation that uh, things might change also in the uh, energy intensive industries. And uh, with this, I would like to introduce our first speaker. This is uh, Juha Hakala from uh, VTT Technical Research Center of Finland. He has almost 20 years of experience in industrial processes, techno-economic concepts, evaluations, modeling, simulations, optimations in a broad field of biorefinery and elsewhere, biotechnology, energy topics, and also plastic waste recycling. And he will give us an um, insight into the prospects of the use of biomass in the steel industry. Um, Juha, the floor is yours, please. Thank you. So I hope you see now my uh, presentation. Yes. Okay, great. And um, uh, my topic today is uh, how to hide this uh, here. My uh, um, topic today, I think it was a prospect for the use of biomass in steel industry. And uh, just in, in the beginning, I would like to introduce uh, Dr. Ilkka Hannula. He proposed this presentation to this workshop. And uh, he is working as a senior scientist and principal investigator in VTT, and he is a, a leading expert in the field of thermochemical conversion processes, to mention some. And Perti Kokkari, he is our research process, process, professor in the field of energy and chemistry. And he is behind also the, this research uh, uh, related to this topic. So as, as a, uh, some background, the research carried out uh, projects are uh, jointly funded project format and uh, uh, SUMMET. Uh, uh, projects and uh, we had the industrial consortium as uh, uh, from iron and steel industry SSAB Europe and uh, from forest sector Finpulp and uh, energy company SD1 biofuels and Valmet technologies and the cover page of the end report you can see on the right. A bit a little bit of the emission which is an important driver on the left hand side, you can see the, the uh, uh, direct industrial emissions worldwide and the iron and steel industry sector presents around 25%. And in Finland, that would be in metal industry around 34% and ferros part presents a major share of this, uh, these direct industry emissions in Finland. And also prices, those are important drivers. These are his, histor, historical prices of the thermal coal at the coastal harbor in Finland. And uh, uh, the blue curve is uh, including excise tax and the uh, uh, red one is excluding excise tax. 
And what is this excise tax in Finland? It, com it comes from the energy, carbon dioxide and supply security parts. And this uh, expressed in euro per tonne, these curves. And it, it, it is also the uh, heating purposes, those are liable for taxation. Taxation and electricity electricity production is non-liable. And also if used as raw or auxiliary material or in imminent primary use in goods manufacturing, it is free of this excess tax. And what then the historical uh, prices of the emission trading, we have hit the level of 30 euros per tonne in September this year. And uh, <clears throat> the forecast is are, uh, foresee the price level of 50 euros in 2030 and 100 euros per tonne of carbon dioxide in 2050. But this uh, forecast did not manage to uh, foresee the price level today. They forecasted uh, uh, 10 euros or below uh, for the current year. Here are the prices for the uh, biomass. Uh, side streams such as forest chips, sawdust and bark. And uh, you can see that uh, sawdust and bark uh, prices, those are a little bit lower than forest chips. And as an example, bark price 17 euros per megawatt hour, that would co uh, correspond to 30 euro per ton as received of bark at the moisture content, content of 60%. Next, I just short overview of the crude steel production and the energy and emissions there. The combined carbon dioxide output from pellet, pelletizing plant, coke plant, blast furnace and oxygen converter that would present around 1,500 1, kilos per ton of crude steel. And uh, the, the major part of the emissions are coming from the blast furnace because of the utilization of coke and the uh, pulver pulverized coal for the injection in the blast furnace. So high amount of carbon is required in, in the form of coke and PCI coal. This is a, a, a schematic of the handling, pulverizing and injection system of coal at as a SSAB. So the uh, coal is first uh, pulverized and uh, the fine, uh, fine coal is pneumatically converted to two-year level at the blast furnace for the injection. So this would be most straightforward option to utilize the biocarbon. Uh, slow pyro pyrolysis that is needed to convert biomaterial to solid metallurgical reduction agent. And this is an example of the Lurgi process and they're uh, producing around 27,000 tons annually, the capacity could be in the two retorts in Australia. And uh, uh, this, uh, this is a retort design. So there is a, a, a drying zone, a carbonization zone and cooling zone. So the, uh, the, this utilizes the pyrolysis gases to provide heat for the drying zone and to cover the endothermic reactions in the pyrolysis process. And there is also cooling so that uh, biocarbon is cooled at the bottom of the retort. And what about the demand then? In a, this is an example again from SSAP, they carried out nine days trial run. Uh, they uh, replaced 10% uh, of PCI coal with biocarbon in May 2019. And in the format project and also SSP, SSAB estimated that around 20% could be possible to replace with the current technical solutions. This would create the demand around 100,000 tons annually. Uh, the supply in Finland, at the moment, there is a capacity to produce 8,000 tons annually. And uh, this could read in the near future, could reach around 18,000 tons. And there are further, further upscaling considerations too. We also estimated theoretical potential in Finland based on the present harvesting of the roundwood. And assuming that all the side streams such as bark, sawdust and wood chips, those would uh, after in-house use load would be converted to biocarbon. That would create around 1.5 million tons annual potential. 
Next, I would like to show the, what is the combined price of utilizing the PCI coal and the emission trade, trade, trading scheme. So if the uh, PCI coal is 100 euros per tonne and emission trading around 30 euros per tonne, the combined cost is 171 euros per tonne. And this is the same table behind, but now I would like to uh, compare to bicarbon production. We, we took the best scenario of the format process and applied the park price of 17 euros per megawatt hour. And this is uh, produced in the integrated manner. Uh, in the PR refinery, utilization, ut utilization of, uh, of low grade heat from the bio refinery and also uh, utilization of the, of the pyrolysis gases at the lime kiln. So this would, uh, uh, we got the estimate for the biocarbon production cost around 220 euros per ton. And if we compare the current uh, scheme of 30 euros per ton, ton of carbon dioxide and coal price. Uh, we are close to being competitive, but not yet. But if there is an increase in emission trading cost or increase in coal price, uh, the situation is different. We would be a competitive. Uh, to conclude, the biocarbon in steel making is becoming a feasible option under current carbon dioxide price projections. And we have studied in the format project uh, the bark and black pellets made of bark and hydrolysis lignin, and we found those as a potential sources for the biocarbon. So about 20% of PCI coal that could be replaced with biocarbon and high, even higher biocarbon share may be possible via coal injection system redesign and bio-optimization of the de detrimental elements in the process. And there are some variations in the physical and chemical properties uh, in the biocarbon, so that would require attention to. The lowest cost we found out was for the, from the scenarios we evaluated was the, uh, from bark integrated to a pulp mill. So there is a clear benefit of production integration. We also uh, studied hydrolysis lignin and uh, also integrated to a pulp and paper mill bit a bit higher cost but uh, not that much and um, and also non-integrated standalone plants close to steel mill would be around 1.5 times the price of the integrated production theoretical potential in finland that is 1.5 million tons and what about the future hydrogen reduction may be available in 2035 and uh, both Finland and Sweden have ambitious plans to convert their blast furnaces by 2045. But are these targets going to, meet, to be met in time frame and the feasible way? Biocarbon, that is a straightforward solution for this transition period to DRI, but also for other, other metal reduction processes smel uh, and as uh, smelting recarburization as energy carrier. And it's good to keep in mind that carbon is required in this deal. Thank you for your attention. So there is a reference list in the end. Yeah, thank you, you have very much for this uh, insight into the uh, approaches in uh, Finland. We have uh, now one question from the chat. Um, and uh, the question is, uh, uh, when you talked about the biomass potential, you talked about um, the potential after in-house use. And can you just give a short explanation what this in-house use is? Um, yes, that is uh, that uh, they, they use, uh, for example, biorefinery, they, uh, uh, they require part of, for example, park at their own process. Uh, to, to produce heat and energy, but there is after the, the they, their needs are met, there is uh, this potential available after this one. Of course, there is a competition uh, of the use of these sources. So, but this is a theoretical potential. So, is it uh, used as uh, to produce energy, or, or is it used as a for in the to, to, as a reduction agent, for example? 
Okay, thank you very much. So you have more potentials, but you also use it in other way. And uh, also in this direction, I would like to add um, a second uh, question we got. Uh, the qu uh, question is, what are the sources um, of the biomass? Yes, we were uh, focusing on the uh, side streams from the forest industry like uh, bark, sawdust, uh, uh, and also there was uh, some forest residues. So uh, those are kind of, uh, we were estimating the industrial sources that you, okay. because of the harvesting is uh, difficult. So we have to find the place where you can find a lot, larger amount, amounts locally. Okay, so you are looking very much for the forest uh, uh, biomass here. We had the question, what about waste? For example, animal waste, but I think these are, yeah, maybe you can say it. I haven't words. studied that, but yes, ah. of course, different biosources we can find, but are those uh, big enough for the, to, to, to have some relevant uh, capacity? Ah, okay, and uh, this also would lead to one question from my side, though, so this biocarbon, do you see this also as a commodity, for example, for the uh, European steel industry, or it's more for domestic use? Um, I think it's, it's, it's a good question. I think where you have the resources, if there is the side streams, uh, uh, that is something uh, uh, I think, of course, if you have biocarbon, you can transport it quite easily. It's dense and, and stable and uh, uh, the energy value is high, but uh, I think that is, uh, should uh, probably it will be some uh, kind of a localized uh, area, for example, northern part of Finland or Sweden. Okay. Just an example. Yeah. Okay, and then I have only one remaining question from the chat. The question is, how is the 20% of PCI limitation explained? Uh, that is uh, depending on the detrimental elements, so, uh, the, so that we don't uh, uh, affect the operation of the blast furnace too much. So there are like a phosphorus and alkalis that cannot be too high. So that is, I think, the main limitation, and also the the the, the injection system that may need some redesigning if the share is higher. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Juha, for this uh, very uh, good uh, presentation, very good insights, and yeah, I can also uh, do this, uh, only do this in the name of the, we have currently more than 140 per participants, and um, uh, with, with this thank you, I would like to introduce... Um, Daniela? Yeah. It's Paul. Can I just remind people if they want to ask a specific question about the presentation to use the Q&A function at the bottom okay. of the page, not the chat? Yeah, okay. This is, yeah, thank you. A very, very important thing. Yes, we have, oh, um, this is important. Can you uh, um, uh, put your uh, Q&A, uh, your questions into the Q&A and not into the chat because we follow mainly the um uh q a port thank you for this paul okay with this we go into the second presentation and i would like to introduce samana marufi i hope i pronounce it well uh, from university of new new south wales uh, she's a lecturer at the school of material science and engineering at the, uh, at the University of New South Wales in Australia. She was one of the leading authors of the IA Bioenergy Task 42 report in alternative sustainable carbon sources at the, as substitutes for metallurgical coal. And she will exactly talk about this, alternative sustainable carbon sources as substitutes for metallurgical coal. So please, the floor is yours. Thank you, Daniela. So do you have my screen? Yes. 
Okay, that's good. Um, hello, good morning and good afternoon, everybody. Um, um, at the beginning, I would like just give a brief, you know, introduction how uh, this project basically started. I'm um, coming from Smart Center Sustainable Material and Research Technology in University of New South Wales. Uh, in our center, we have uh, the experience of working with uh, steel making, oil and steel making for several years, and we have the experience of uh, commercialization in regard uh, with the use of waste polymer in steel making. So for that one, uh, because of that, basically uh, Microbiogen basically company in uh, in Australia approached us to uh, uh, to work on the on the on the byproduct of the process, basically lignin, which was uh, producing from uh, the process. Microbiogen uh, has been working in the area of second generation bioethanol for more than uh, 15 years. So we started basically to investigate uh, uh, the possibility of utilizing their by uh, byproduct, I mean uh, lignin, in iron and steel making. So as um, I think uh, Johav uh, explained uh, very well in terms of um, uh, the emission of carbon dioxide, so I, do, I don't want you know, to repeat, but generally speaking, all of us, we know that um, um, iron and steel making is one of the most intensive um, 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 energy intensive uh, industries. And um, uh, uh, carbon is one of the key materials which is used in iron and steel making and approximately 1.1 billion um, uh, basically, um, um, ton of uh, metallurgical coal, uh, metallurgical basically coal is consumed annually, which is uh, contribute more than 15% of the total uh, coal production. And basically, uh, this huge uh, consumption of the coal result basically in for a generation of 3 billion ton of carbon, um, um, carbon dioxide. So which means that uh, more than 27% of the carbon dioxide emission of the global manufacturing sector belongs to the um, iron and um, uh, steel making. Um, when we are talking about the use of coal or coke in um, oil and steel making, the first thing actually comes to our mind is about um, energy consumption and the, the use of uh, basically energy. But uh, in reality, in oil and steel making, we are using coke and coal for different purposes. And if we have a look at the general procedure associated with the oil and steel making, whether through blast furnace um, uh, and uh, basically um, basic oxygen vessel or electric arc furnace, we are using different types of the uh, basically coke and uh, obviously with different quality, with different characteristic because the role which is played by coke at different parts of oil and steel making is different. And it is really important for us um, uh, to understand that. What I'm trying to say that I, um, uh, although uh, biomass can be a great source of energy in iron and steel making or in cement industry, but we need to have a look a bit deeper uh, because uh, of the valuable element which are present inside the biomass is not only about energy. So from that perspective, we need to have a look uh, generally in iron and steel making. As I told you, in iron and steel making, we are using different types of coke and coal. For example, the thermal coal, which uh, normally we use that for the purpose of the combustion and providing energy. But met coal can be, I mean, used for different pur for other purposes, such as you know, reductant and um, other purposes. So, um, uh, obviously, yes, depending Amara? on the sorry, yes. very short. Can you just make your uh, screen in full presentation? I'm sorry for this. Yeah, you know? sure. I realized it. Yeah, sure. Okay, perfect. Sorry for that. Yeah. yeah. Um, um, so, um, uh, depending, uh, I mean, at the, I mean, at different stages of the um, uh, um, iron and steel making and in different process, so we are using different types of coke and obviously the price associated with each coke and coal is completely uh, different. For example, the thermal coke uh, we are using normally used for the purpose of the combustion and providing energy um, um, uh, is much cheaper compared to the met coke because uh, for the, I mean, uh, we need uh, met coke for um, maybe um, other basically purposes. Um, 
Um, so the reason being that we need to uh, find alternative resource in an oil and steel making basically comes from two perspectives. Uh, one from, I mean, uh, uh, economical and uh, another one from the environmental basically perspective. Uh, the first reason is that the cost of the coke, uh, you know, has uh, raised uh, in recent years. And the second, because of the depletion of natural resources. And the third reason, because of the tight, uh, tightening environmental regulation associated with the carbon dioxide emission. And uh, at the same time, we want to basically replace the coke that we are using in the steel making with alternative resources, considering that we don't want basically uh, to introduce large capital cost to you know to the to the process. We want to basically replace um, uh, our coke and coal with minimum uh, basically capital cost. And um, obviously, we want to reduce the footprint without uh, seriously affecting the process efficiency. And still, the efficiency of the process is really important uh, for us. Um, as I told you, in iron and steel making, whether we are producing that through blast furnace and basic oxygen vessel or through um, uh, electric arc furnace, we are using different types of coke for different purposes. But generally speaking, three main roles uh, are played by um, uh, carbon resources which are used in iron and steel making. One is physical role, which is uh, normally in blast furnace in this um, um, basically term, coke influences the gas distribution in the shaft and provide mechanical support to the charge column and uh, permeable bed below the cohesive zone. And in terms of the chemical role, um, coal, uh, coke and coal basically are used as a reducing agent to reduce iron oxide and other basically oxide and provide carbon, extra carbon to diffuse into the iron or to carburize in molten basically iron. And the third reason is for the thermal role. I mean, um, carbon can be combusted and um, as a uh, um, as a result of the combustion, it can provide heat to the um, to the process because of you know um, 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 uh, because of the I mean as a result of the uh, combustion and the heat that we require for the reaction of the uh, reaction between slag and um, uh, metallic phase. So that's why in, uh, uh, in that perspective, we try to uh, um, basically to do different tests and uh, trial how we could uh, basically use uh, the lignin that actually we received from uh, microbiogen and how we could basically implement that in um, um, iron and um, steel making. So investigated, we investigated from two aspects. One was thermal degradation uh, to basically, uh, to basically uh, examine uh, the, the the behavior of that um, uh, lignin at high temperature, at a temperature close to the iron and steel making process, and then um, in terms of the reduction as a reducing agent in the reduction of iron oxide to the metallic, uh, basically. Um, um, iron. Um, um, generally speaking, any biomass or bioresource that you want to um, in, uh, basically use that in iron and steel making, we need to investigate that from different aspects. Uh, it's not only about uh, thermal treatment and providing basically energy. We need to investigate that from uh, from uh, basically from the pur purpose purpose of the uh, chemical role as well as a reducing agent, as a carburizer, as a um, in terms of the generation of the gas and in terms of the characteristic of the uh, biomass, then we could decide that in which stage of iron and steel making we could use that biomass. Um, sometimes we just need to mix biomass with other waste resources. For example, if I just want to give you uh, one example that at the moment we are doing with our uh, industry. Uh, we are, for example, trying to use biomass as a top charge in electric arc furnace. Uh, and obviously, okay, for um, in terms of the carbon um, content and in terms of the reducing agent, maybe the biomass is a good source. But in terms of the mechanical property, biomass residue is not satisfying the, the, the requirement that we need as a top charge for, for electric arc furnace. So in that sense, we need to meet 
mix that with other resources and um, increase the density of the uh, basically uh, feedstock material and then be introduced to the to the electric arc furnace or if you want to use that resource as an injection for the slag forming we need to have a look at the emission of the gas what i'm trying to say that the characteristic of the biomass play a critical role in making decision in which stage uh, we could use that resource in iron and steel making because for some biomass we've got high content of the gas emission which can be for example good for the slag forming for some cases it might uh, have a uh, high content of the solid carbon which can be good as a um, as a top charge in electric arc furnace but in some cases maybe the quality of the uh, biomass is really good with many more basically ash which can be used in a uh, blast furnace so it is really important to have a look at the whole chemical characteristic of the uh, biomass so this is the sample that we received from um, uh, microbiogen in this table you could see the the general general characterization of the lignin in compared to the uh, metallurgical coke i just put that you know just for the general basically comparison in terms of the ash content as you could see uh, lignin compared to the met coke has got uh, less ash which is really good and the solid carbon is not that bad 20 percent but still we've got total carbon of 40 percent which means that uh, the carbon, I mean, uh, as a reducing agent can be um can be used as a, I mean, the reducing gas, which is uh, get liberated from biomass can be used as a reducing agent in the reduction of iron oxide in iron and steel, um, uh, basically uh, making. Um, and here, uh, I was just trying to show the, the reduction of iron oxide using the lignin that, you know, we did the experiment at different temperature from 1300 to 1600 degrees C. The reduction was um, very fast. As you know, that iron oxide is not that stable, even with a small amount of solid carbon, with reducing gases such as carbon monoxide, methane, hydrogen, which is uh, gets emitted from the biomass, we could, we could have a complete reduction of iron oxide to the metallic iron. So here, as you could see that in figure A, we've got a palette of mixture of iron oxide and uh, basically lignin and in figure basically uh, B you could see the result of the reduction at different temperature from 1300 up to 1600 even at 1300 we were able to get reduction of um, iron oxide to the metallic iron um, so um, basically at uh, 1300 because we've got some um, trap um, uh, carbon as a free carbon inside you know the in center uh, carbon but with increasing the temperature obviously carbon uh, start diffusing iron and decreasing the melting point of the iron and iron get you know basically um, uh, uh, molten so our experiment basically um, showed that uh, uh, with uh, the reduction of iron oxide using lignin uh, was uh, quite fast in uh, maybe less than five minutes at 1600 degrees we were able to reach the complete reduction of iron oxide to the to the metallic um, iron so here in this image you could see the emission of the basically gas as a reduction of iron oxide to the metallic iron using uh, lignin and these um, uh, experiment basically showed that the lignin that we received from from a microbiogen can be a good uh, reducing agent in terms of reduction of um, basically um, um, iron oxide. Um, um, as I told you, um, um, in iron and steel making, um, there are lots of opportunity for the replacement of the coke with um, uh, biomass resources, but we need to pay attention in which basically part we want to be uh, replaced because um, we use different types of coke and coal in iron and steel making and the characteristic for each part is different. For example, the coke that we are using in ladle furnace is very high quality uh, because we don't want, we want to, we don't want to introduce any impurity to the later furnace but for example in the case of the electric arc furnace we've got more flexibility and uh, we could use a wide range of uh, maybe uh, biomass but still we need to have a look at the chemical characteristic in terms of the content of the carbon the emission of the gas the chemical behavior in terms of the reducing uh, agent in, uh, in the reduction of iron oxide and in terms of the um, uh, diffusion into the iron and the carburization and with considering a, a whole i mean the whole characteristic then we could decide that how we could use that biomass in iron steel making so in some cases we need to 
mix that basically biomass with other resources to meet the criteria that actually uh, we uh, uh, we need in iron and uh, steel making. So the thermal... Okay. Ter Sam Samanare, could you come to your conclusion, please? Yes, yeah, sure. Because time yeah. is over. Yeah, sure. So, and uh, basically the thermal transformation um, of lignin re resulted in reasonable uh, yield of sol um, solid carbon. Um, although the composition varied most detected impurity in the lignin would be tolerated or would be advan even advantageous to the steel making. And um, um, the reduction of iron oxide um, basically require a relatively low value of activation energy and had high temperature reduction is basically complete even with you know at low temperature but as a basically conclusion it can be a win win basically project uh, because uh, we are not basically tackling the problem associated with the basically biomass at the same time we are tackling uh, a problem associated with the steel making and we are trying you know to make economical benefit for both uh, basically um, industry in terms of uh, um, lowering the cost of the steel making but replacing natural and base uh, replacing coke with the uh, biomass and also uh, the use of uh, byproduct of the biomass processing in uh, steel making and thank you for your attention okay thank you very much um zamane we have uh, one yeah, oh, sorry, can yes. you can you hear me? Yes, okay. yes. Yeah. So thank you very much, Samane. And we unfortunately we don't have time for uh, discussing uh, questions. And but there's one question in the uh, question and answers uh, rubric, and maybe you can uh, just tip the uh, the answer there. Um. Yeah. And with this, I would like to uh, introduce the next speaker. Speaker. This is Win. Van der Sticht from ArcelorMittal, a women's uh, chief technology officer uh, in technology strategy as, as ArcelorMittal Belgium in, in relation of CO2 and circular economy. And he will uh, give us an insight into turning carbon emissions from blast furnace gas into bioethanol at ArcelorMittal Gen. So please, uh, Wim. We are uh, looking for your presentation. Thank you. First of all, I would like to thank the organizers, of course, for considering me to have this uh, presentation today. Um, so I will discuss um, our project uh, to turn our emissions from our blast furnace into bioethanol with the demonstration project at ArcelorMittal again. First of all, I always start with a short introduction to highlight the issue we have. It's already been shown in the first presentation that uh, steel is responsible for uh, a large volume of uh, CO2 emissions worldwide. We uh, have 7% from steel sector alone. Uh, on the other hand, steel is also the fabric of life. You cannot imagine a society without steel. An example you see here is a nice uh, library building in the city of Ghent which would not have been able to realize without the use of steel. So we have uh, an issue. Um, steel uh, is also typically mostly still produced by the blast furnace route, uh, discussed also in the previous two presentations. And for those not familiar with steel, um, what is really the core process in the blast furnace is the reduction of the iron oxide. And this is a molecule of pure iron oxide where you need reductant to remove the uh, oxide atoms. And there we, need, we use mostly still carbon in the form of coal, PCI or coke in the blast furnace to do this chemical process. And at that, that stage, you produce a lot of carbon monoxide and carbon dioxide. So Arshamital has been working intensively the last years to come up with a plan, action plan on how to solve the issue with the carbon emissions. One of the main projects that we are now engaging in is the Stilanol project. And there you see the concept depicted in the schematic. Uh, what we want to do is to start from a renewable carbon source. In our case, this is wood waste, of which we first produce a 
bio call via a uh, torrefaction process, and this bio call we will inject into the blast furnace to replace PCI. Then we make our uh, hot metal, and the gases which are kept captured from the blast furnace, we will first have undergo a gas treatment to remove part of the uh, gases that we do not need. And then we will send a carbon monoxide rich stream into a bioreactor. In reality, it will be four bioreactors in which we have a microbe, which was developed by the company Lanzatec to transform the carbon monoxide via a gas fermentation process into ethanol. So we will have in the real reactor a reaction that produces ethanol from carbon monoxide, which is in fact similar to a brewery or a winemaking uh, facility. But instead of sugars, we use carbon monoxide as a feed for the microbes. We end up with a solution of a few percent ethanol in water. So then this solution has to undergo a distillation step. And there we will produce um, a 99% pure uh, ethanol, which we can bring onto the market to blend in with gasoline. Uh, Europe has, has a target by 2030 to blend in 14% of renewable fuel into uh, gasoline. Uh, and this uh, process that we are performing will um, comply with this regulation. So we will be able to, um, to help Europe to reach this target. The plant uh, is also uh, very uh, sustainable in the sense that the water that we will use in the process, we will recover and we will re take out all of the elements, useful elements out of the water to produce uh, biomass that we can then either use for cogeneration or we can also produce uh, feed from it on the longer term for uh, use in agriculture. Here you see a view of our plant in Ghent, and then you can follow the different steps that it will take on the plant. So we will have our torrefaction plant close to a centering process where we'll produce the biocoal. It will be transported uh, chromatically to our two blast furnaces where it will be injected. The gas will be uh, captured and will then be sent to our stenolol plant, which we are building opposite of the current power plant. Uh, so that we can reuse the piping. The cost of the project is about 165 million euros, with which we will produce 64,000 tons of ethanol per year. And we will also produce uh, 50,000 tons per year of biocoal from the bio food waste. Uh, this will result in a greenhouse gas emission reduction, uh, which is equivalent to 80 million liters of gasoline which is about the same as 100,000 100, electrical cars on the road. We estimate to go to full production beginning of 2022. Um, what is now the environment impact we see of this project? We see it multiple. First of all, we will use waste wood as a source. So this waste wood will not be incinerated anymore to produce energy. So we avoid emissions on that level. We will produce the bio coal, which will replace fossil coal from which is regularly used in the blast furnace. So also there we will uh, reduce the use of uh, fossil coal. The ethanol can then be used uh, in chemical industry and refineries. So it will replace uh, the standard use of gold, uh, oil or gas. So that also there we will avoid fossil emissions. And of course, in the end, when we make a fuel out of it, it will then be used in transport, where at that time you will then have, of course, uh, emissions of CO2. The bio coal we will produce from uh, waste wood, as you see uh, this picture here. This wood will be originating from uh, municipal waste collection centers, where it will be uh, uh, sourced from uh, old furniture, deconstruction of buildings, or even side products from the wood industry. So it will be uh, really wasted wood, not, not fresh wood. We are...
here you see uh, a picture of our uh, bio facility. We are still constructing it. So um, you see here um, the arrival of the waste wood. It will come mostly by trucks. There will be a drying unit because the wet wood, the wood will contain, contain still some 20 to 25 percent of water. So we need to dry it first. It will go via transportation through our bioreactor, our torrefaction reactor, where it will be heated up to about 300 degrees to remove volatiles and to make the, um, the bio coal grindable very fine so that we can inject it into our blast furnace. Um, the ethanol production facility is also under construction. Uh, here you see a picture of uh, January 2019, where we had just finished the leveling works, the ground works. So you see it's quite a significant uh, size. Huh? And here you can see a picture of uh, last month. Huh? So you can see that the construction has uh, evolved significantly uh, with steel works going on. You see also on the left side uh, a digester, which we'll use to uh, um, digest the uh, remaining biomass from the reactor to produce then biogas for the production of energy and steam, uh, electricity and steam. Um, in the middle of the picture, you can see the steelworks where we will have the four bioreactors implemented that will produce the ethanol. Um, and then uh, this is the end of my presentation. Thank you. Yeah, Wim, thank you very much for this uh, very living insight into uh, the real world uh, development. Um, I have uh, one question in the question uh, here from the audience. And this is what happens to the current incinerators? Uh, are they out of commission or are they simply using another type of fuel? Um, well, there are two, two incinerator types. So we have first the incineration of the gas, the blast furnace gas that we are currently producing already. This is now incinerated to produce electricity. I think there on the longer term, you will see that um, these type of insulations will disappear because in the end, um, this electricity is produced from a fossil source. So I think on the long term, this cannot be sustained anymore, eh? but we're talking here 10, 20 years or so. And then of course, the incinerators of the waste wood. I think there are also the policy, certainly in Belgium, the policy is to reduce the amount of uh, waste wood to be used for uh, incineration uh, for power. So I imagine mm -hmm. also in a period of 10 to 20 years, this uh, way of working will, will disappear. You see also in Belgium that the incentives to produce uh, the green certificates to produce power from uh, waste wood, from biomass, they have been stopped now and there are no new certificates anymore and the existing ones, they will also expire. So I assume this practice will disappear and the incineration will then have to use other types of waste for which there is currently no, no outlet or no use other than, than landfill. Okay, and this might uh, also lead to a second question. Uh, will the blast furnace use 100% biocool or what are substitution shares uh, which you expect? Um, with the current project, we estimate between 5 and 10% of the powder coal to be replaced. So the coke we will not replace with this uh, scheme because the bio coal is simply not strong enough uh, to support uh, mm -hmm. the process in the blast furnace. Uh, we have one practice where we use charcoal really as a replacement of coke in the blast furnace in Brazil. But these are smaller blast furnaces where the pressure on the material is lower. Uh, but in Ghent uh, or in typically in a European large blast furnace, this is not possible. Our target would be, if possible, to go to about 50% replacement of the powder coal. And then you will run into certain difficulties, uh, as mentioned also earlier in, in the first presentation, with the uh, exploitation of the blast furnace. Um, maybe if I can comment in general, I think blast furnaces, the, the exploitation of it, 
will change anyhow over the, the coming years due to higher level of injections of gases, hydrogen, methane. Um, so it will change anyhow. So it will be difficult to estimate to what level we will be able to go for this uh, biocoal injection. We hope to get to 50% at least. Okay. So we have uh, sent us also some more, a lot of question. And I also kindly ask you to have a look in the uh, question and answers after our discussion here. But I would like to ask uh, one additional question uh, from the audience. Then is what is um, uh, the impact of this process on the overall site energy consumption? Um, on the energy consumption, um, well, the main impact is that we will use less um, powder coal in the end. Eh? Um, I think um, otherwise on the whole plant, there is no real impact because in the end, carbon is carbon. So the amount of gas that you uh, will produce in the blast furnace will not change that drastically. Uh, um, of course, the Gas that we use to produce the ethanol, we cannot use to produce power. Uh, but I think that is a good, good evolution. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, the more we use the gas to produce a chemical, the less we produce fossil electricity. So in the end, it will have a positive impact on the, the greening of the grid. Uh, I think there uh, we will have to most likely have to uh, import a bit more electricity to compensate for this gas. But at this okay. stage, it is relatively negligible because we only use 10% of the blast furnace gas for this ethanol production. So it is relatively negligible. Okay, thank you. And um, in this direction, I would uh, ask one final question from my side. This uh, ethanol, you said it is, let's say, considerable under the European uh, Renewable Energy Directive. And can you give me an idea how much is the greenhouse gas emission reduction of this ethanol compared to uh, yeah, standard gasoline? Um, we have done a few LCAs eh? and they vary a bit depending on the um, the the CO2 burden of the grid, if you have to take that into account. Eh? Mm. Um, but we are uh, between, let's say, 80 to 85 percent less emissions compared to uh, gasoline. Okay. Yeah. Thank you very much, Wim. Please have a look at the question and answers. And with this, I would like to hand over to Luc again. Yes, Daniela. Thank you. I would like to set up the next uh, poll question. So, uh, share this again. So now we can see the results of the previous poll. So, when should global steel and cement factories reach carbon neutrality? And I think it's still kind of uh, where we left it uh, in the beginning uh, when we launched the call. So, most people think that uh, by 2050 or e or even 2040, uh, these sectors should reach uh, carbon neutrality. I will now go to the next poll. Um, so the next question that we'd like to uh, have your input is what are the most important co-benefits for industry to use biomass in metallurgical production? So what is really the main driver for industry to do this? Uh, I think you can select a few options, uh, the ones that you think are most relevant. So. Um, the options are, well, to, to, to have emission certificates that they can use for EPS, uh, or they can be internal uh, decarbonization targets, can also be an important driver. Uh, there can be uh, consumer demands, uh, can be a driver of consumers who want more sustainable products, uh, or you can have additional value from, uh, from carbon, carbon that you can capture in the process, uh, or the public acceptance of the facility can, can increase. So I think you can select uh, two of the options. Um, for people are new, so you can go to slido.com in parallel to your uh, to the Zoom system, or you can also take your smartphone, uh, type slido.com, you will go to the app and then uh, type Q988 to get access. I will leave this question again open until we go to the next call. So that will be uh, two after the, Two more presentations, I believe.
right. So this this will stay open, so your input is still uh, welcome, and we'll see the results uh, in twenty minutes or so. Yes, thank you, Luke, for this. And uh, we go now to the next uh, presentation. It will be given by Elliot. Uh, sorry, I have a problem here. Elliot Marie. Um, he's an engineer in industrial decarbonization project financing finance climact at the industry department of ADEM, the French agency of ecological transition. And he will give a presentation on the role of biomass in decarbonization of cement industries. So Elliot, please, the floor is yours. Thank you. Is the sound good? Yes, sound is good. Perfect. Um, Picture's perfect. Great. Uh, thank you, Daniela. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, like, uh, like Daniela just said, I will be presenting the role of uh, bioenergy in the decarbonization of the French cement industry. Uh, so I was kindly invited to do this presentation because for a couple of months now we've been working on a national roadmap for the cement industry in France along with the major uh, cement companies and as part of this roadmap uh, we've also analyzed the issues surrounding the use of uh, bioenergy in this, in this sector. So I've organized this presentation in such a way to um, to sweep over all the, um, what we found to be the most critical aspects to consider regarding the use of fly energy in the cement industry. And uh, all these elements will be um, more or less summarized into a short uh, analysis at the end. So um, about the cement production, maybe the most important thing to remember uh, is that uh, all the direct emissions from a cement plant occur at the burning process. Um, about two thirds of these emissions are called process emissions, resulting from a limestone calcination. And the last third uh, is caused by the combustion of fuel to provide to provide the energy. And this is where uh, this is where bioenergy can be used in the process. So the first thing to bear in mind is that um, in theory, bioenergy can only abate at most um, about thirty percent of the emissions from uh, from the cement industry. Um, going to the second graph here, uh, this graph shows that all the main um, types of fuels are used by the French cement industry uh, to provide the, the heat and along uh, it is represented along with their uh, emission factors and their fraction of biogenic uh, carbon. So there are different types, uh, the different types of fuels. The first, uh, the first category is what uh, is the traditional fossil fuels, mainly uh, mainly petroleum, coke, and coal, and the rest is often referred to as substitution fuels. And these are uh, essentially uh, waste fuels. Uh, and among these substitution fuels, we differentiate two, uh, two categories, which are called uh, low biomass content fuels. So these are, uh, these are not fossil fuels, and you can still uh, possibly contain a certain fraction of biomass. And the other category is what we've called high biomass content fuels, which are composed of almost 100% of uh, biogenic carbon. So these are mostly uh, agricultural waste and wood waste. So with, uh, with this graph here, the second most important element uh, to remember is that um, substitution fuels can still contain a very uh, high fraction of fossil carbon. Consequently, um, switching to uh, substitution fuels can only be one part of their decarbonization strategy. Uh, we've modeled the targets of the French Cement Association, which was to reach a substitution rate of 95% uh, by 2050, of which 45% is biogenic carbon. And as you can see on this switch curve, uh, changing the thermal mix can only uh, contribute to a small fraction of the GHG mitigation pathway. And the reason uh, that the potential period is limited uh, is, uh, like I said, uh, emissions of uh, energy related emissions um, uh, represent only one third of the emissions from the industry. And secondly, uh, alternative fuels can still contain a very high fraction of fossil carbon. Um, the next thing I would like to point out are the 
potential investments needed to increase the substitution rate. And this is really uh, this is, uh, also important for uh, because uh, this is where a government subsidy can come into play. Uh, so the first possible source of CapEx uh, is the plant upgrading. So there are different types of cement manufacturing processes and uh, and as of today, only the bat process, so the dry process with the pre calcina uh, can integrate a very high share of substitution fuel uh, with a high biogenic content. And it's all, all the more important to, to bear in mind uh, because, uh, because the European countries, in, your, in, in some European countries, uh, many plants still run on all the processes and it's in, even more true in France actually. And the second uh, possible source of capital investments relates to the new equipment needed to process the waste such as uh, sorting systems uh, or uh, stored silos. Uh, so the way we've modeled it is, uh, is shown on this upper right graph uh, that can give you an order of scale. Uh, so the cumulative investments go from zero to 95% substitution rate uh, is close to about 20 million euros. So it can, it can be, um, the need for CapEx can be quite, in, uh, quite important. Um, now I'd like to draw your attention to the past uh, evolution of the thermal mix of the French cement fleet and tell you maybe a bit more about what this trend reveals. So for, for the past 10 years, uh, since the global financial crisis, the use of low biomass content fuels has been steadily increasing. So these are the, uh, the fuels with uh, different shades of orange. Uh, whereas the use of high biomass content fuels has remained rather flat. And the main reason behind this, uh, this evolution is that the industry has restructured uh, to be more competitive and that uh, most waste fuels are actually cheaper than conventional uh, fossil fuels. And sometimes companies are uh, even getting paid for uh, processing the waste. So it has now become a, uh, a com competitive advantage for, for an industry. On the other hand, the industry report uh, difficulties to find um, good quality uh, fuels with a high biomass uh, content. So these uh, these uh, fuels with a high biomass content can be um, can be harder to access or uh, economic for the for the cement industry. Another aspect that advocates for the for the use of substitution fuels is that it is an efficient um, option for high temperature waste treatment. So basically, the cement process is one with the highest operating temperature in the heavy industry. That combined with a long exposure time in, in the kiln inlet completely destroys the, the waste and the elements it contains. On top of that, uh, all the ashes and residues from the combustion can be recycled into the raw meal and incorporated into the clinker matrix, which we later form as cement. And uh, it, it even has capacity to, uh, to integrate some heavy metals in, into the matrix. So that's what this uh, ternary diagram on this slide shows, uh, where uh, the different uh, types of fuels uh, contain uh, calcium oxide, alumina, silica, which are all um, main components of cement clinker. Um, last but not least, the potential sources of waste for the cement industry. So the question of waste availability uh, highly depends on the type of waste we're um, talking about and inevitably the, the waste quality. So what, uh, so what, I, and what I will say here in the slide is uh, really specific to the French, uh, to the, um, to the French context. Uh, it can be quite different from uh, a, a country to another. And uh, I know, for instance, that um, the context is uh, quite different in, uh, in Germany, for instance. Um, so uh, regarding RDS, so RDS stands for a refused derived fuel. So regarding RDS and uh, wood waste and deconstruction, there's good reason to believe that uh, in France, they remain a, an impact potential. Uh, since the fair share of this uh, of this waste stream is currently still uh, landfilled, but for some other waste streams like shredded tires and uh, animal meal, for instance, the perspective for growth seems um, more limited. Uh, everything that uh, is produced is uh, reused, already reused. 
Uh, overall, I would say that uh, in France, again, uh, there's clearly room for increasing the use of sub substitution fuels um, in the cement industry, uh, because this uh, cement industry is a, uh, is a category of um, is a category of consumer that relies on a particular uh, biomass and waste streams. Basically, they they can take what other uh, end users cannot process or don't want. Um, in a nutshell, I would uh, conclude by summarizing the most critical aspects. So I won't go, go through them all. I will just um, uh, point out the most uh, critical ones. Uh, so the use of substitution fuels uh, in the cement industry has a limited decomposition potential. And that's the main re reason why I believe that uh, conducting a national sectorial indus industry roadmap should be part of the recommendation. You know, um, it can't be a single, uh, a single so solution and it has to be articulated with a, a, a broader set of measures. Um, a possible outcome is um, if CCS cannot be uh, implemented on every cement plant by 2050 for technical or economic reasons, um, the use of substitution fuels at this stage by 2050 can become a source of um, hard to abate locked in emissions. So if you consider the fact that the availability uh, of substitution fuels can be impacted by um, some policy measures uh, fostering um, material efficiency and recycling, um, which is also high on the environmental agenda, it appears that uh, encouraging uh, research on um, the electrification of the cement kiln is a, is a relevant move to hedge ourselves against the risk of um, locked-in emissions and potential waste supply shortages. So uh, that's basically it for me. Uh, thank you very much for your time and for your attention. I think my time is up. Well, yeah. Thank you very much, Elliot, for this uh, uh, good uh, in insight into the cement industry. And we have, for the time being, two direct questions. One is, is RDF quality from municipal solid waste comparable with cement industry? Yes, so com that's- Compatible, uh, sorry. Yes, yeah, so that's a very, uh, so that's, that's a really uh, important question. I didn't have to, to touch on this, the, this issue, but uh, RDF quality is uh, very essential for the industry. Um, in terms of when I say uh, when I speak of quality, I mostly speak about um, energy content and low heating value. And uh, what we see is that uh, cement industry often has trouble to find high uh, uh, high quality RDF. And because the industry cannot process, um, I mean, the industry, the cement industry, needs a thermal mix with the average. Um, with an average uh, low heating value of about um, uh, 20 megajoules per kilogram. And a lot of these, uh, of the waste of the RDF uh, are actually uh, are actually lower than that. So they, they cannot integrate a very high fraction of low quality uh, uh, RDF because this will impact the burning process. So um, yeah, so that will be my question. That will be my, my answer. It's, uh, it's, it, 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 can be difficult for the industry to find high quality uh, RDF fuel. Okay, thank you. Then we had the question, how could you differentiate between biomass-based cement products and conventional cement products? Um, both, um, so in terms of um, products, uh, they're both, uh, I mean, um, both will be uh, the same uh, quality. It will not impede on the, uh, it will not impact quality uh, in, in the quality in cement. The only thing that uh, that the use of biomass and substitution fuels in general can uh, can have an impact is the um, is the the thermal efficiency of the process. Usually, what you see is that uh, when you integrate a high fraction of substitution fuels, you um, you deteriorate the uh, the average uh, thermal intensity of the process. Um, by uh, five to eight percent, it depends. But in terms of uh, product quality, I um, we didn't find that it had um, a uh, it didn't have a, have an impact on the uh, on the clinker. Okay, 
Thank you. And then I have a final question. I was uh, really surprised about your, let's say, low uh, use of waste wood. Did you uh, uh, also investigate what CO2 prices would be necessary to unlock this potential, for example, in the direction of the cement industry? Uh, yes. So, um... So in in the modeling that we did, so I, uh, I I cannot answer for the for the for the wood waste because I I mean I, I don't know how much uh, how much wood waste is traded uh, between the cement and the deconstruction companies, uh, but I can I can speak for the uh, for the um, for the other I mean marginally for the other types of waste. What we found is that uh, on average uh, um, today uh, in the cement industry. Uh, Substitution fuels have uh, have an average price of uh, you'll be surprised of zero gigajoule uh, of zero years per gigajoule, and uh, that reflects uh, that reflects the fact that um, sometimes um, companies are getting paid for processing this waste. So the only uh, the only uh, surplus, the only thing that you will need is the is the capital and uh, investment needed for uh, for processing this waste, and overall. Uh, the from the analysis that we have, um, the average carbon uh, average carbon price needed is negative because it is in uh, uh, as we model it, it is a economic in opportunity in France to uh, to integrate a higher fraction of biomass. So over the long term, it is a um, for uh, for a lot of companies, it is a profitable in investment. It doesn't need it, it doesn't need a carbon price and so on. Okay. No, oh, thank it. you also for this clarification. Also, sure. I uh, ask you to have a look at the question and yes, answers and uh, add some uh, feedback there. Um, we still have 150 participants uh, looking forward also for this additional information. Yes. And uh, I would like uh, then to uh, present our next speaker. This is Veda Helanti from Walmart. Heda Veda Helanti is a product manager gasification at Walmart Technologies in Finland, and he will talk about biomass gasification for industrial kilns. So please, uh, Visa, we are looking Thank forward. Thank you. I will open and put my show in display. Everything okay there? Not yet. We are still waiting. Oh, sorry. sorry. My mistake. I'm not even going to confess you what I did. <laughs> I need to share my screen, of course, first. Um, okay. Now probably better. Yes. And now please go into the presentation mode. Yes. Yes. Okay. Perfect. I, I am coming from a company a little bit aside of cement and steel industry. In Valmet, we have 12, 40,000 people working for mostly for paper, pulp, and energy industries, some other branches too. And for pulp and energy, which is the part I'm presenting also, is about 2,000 people working there. And here I have put some basic information of our company. I'm not going to read this through, but we have a long experience on biomass, like everybody in Finland, I think. And uh, we have delivered plants for de decades, even centuries, but uh, this is more, slide is more handling the most modern technology and boilers, where we, at least we strongly think we are one of the leaders in the world. Visa, sorry, very sorry for interrupt you, but your uh, 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 voice is not so good. Maybe you can switch off the camera just to have more, uh, a better data trans transportation. Thank you. Okay, just a second. Uh, I need to. 
find out. No, just switch off the camera. Only the camera. Yeah. So sorry, sorry. Though now you switched off the presentation. Yeah. So it's here. Yes, I'm trying to find out. Uh, yes. And now the camera off. Perfect. And now I hope we hear you much clearer. Sorry for this interruption. Yeah. Sorry. Do I have my camera off now? I don't think yes. so. Yes, okay. it is off. That's interesting because I didn't press anything. <laughs> okay. So, anyway, about the company and uh, my presentation is about one part of the technology we are manufacturing. My own child with it. So, it's about gasification, which is uh, one way of applying biomasses and waste in different industrial processes. And uh, in Valmet, we do have uh, one major gasification technology, one part of the whole field, a CFB gasifier, circulating fluid at bed gasifier, which is one of the simple ones in the field of gasification. And uh, it's a big industrial unit meant to be a workforce where it's uh, applicable and uh, we make gasifiers and offer them for biomass fuels and waste fuels also. And for waste application, we have a little bit more complicated systems, but uh, let's stay in the biomass preferably in this presentation. If anybody's interested, I'm available for extra information later on. And what the CFP gasifier does, it produces hot, low pressure and quite low heating value gases. And for CFP gasifier, the main use for the gas is to combust it in flames. It is not suitable for chemical process, raw material, not for engine use, just for combustion. And as said, we use different uh, biofuels and for us waste is kind of an ecological fuel also because this is one alternative to uh, enhance it as a proper fuel. And uh, there's one important thing remaining to say about the our approach to gasification, we think that gasifier is a thing that makes uh, fuel useful in a process where it otherwise would not fit. And uh, for biofuel, we have experience, especially on installing gasifiers for lime kilns in pulp mills, a little bit not so steel industry central. And uh, a modern pulp mill can use a couple of hundred thousands of a uh, couple of hundred thousands of kilos of heavy fuel oil a day to make lime for its process. And with uh, a gasifier, it is possible to replace most of that fuel by the biomasses already typically available in the pulp mill. So it's a very good place in many ways to replace fossil fuel by biomasses. First, of course, it's biomass is available. And secondly, it has a green impact on the public image. And third, and not the least one, is the economical benefit. In a Scandinavian market, our oil prices and all, the replacement can produce close to 10% of the whole outcome of the pulp mill in the scale of 100,000 euros per day. And uh, okay, here I have the process for the pulp mill, but maybe we don't go too deep into that. 
how we do it is a quite simple system. First, we need to dry our biomass. That is important because uh, lime kiln requires quite high flame temperatures. And with the uh, wet biomass usually available, the flame temperature would not be high enough for the process to proceed. After drying, we have a gasifier, which gasifies by partially burning the biomass and producing the aforementioned uh, product gas, and uh, it's led directly to the kiln. And uh, quite, quite simple, I would say. And where our expertise lies is, of course, uh, dimensioning and uh, manufacturing the equipment and being able to integrate these and integrate them in the product process control. And for the pulp mill side, we have something like uh, 600 megawatts of uh, referencing from the recent years. We have to remember that even so, all our references uh, are quite recent. The technology itself is not, it is uh, first applied in 1980s due to high oil prices. Then it was moved aside because oil prices fell down again. And uh, this is kind of a second coming of the technology. So in comparison with the very interesting presentations here, this is a, an old technology simple one, but it's also very beneficial for both the customers and uh, environment. And uh, now the bridge to the topic of the seminar. Naturally, we are looking for new applications for all our products and uh, especially for the gasifier, we have been uh, studying a little bit the steel industry, also the cement industry, but as uh, Mr. Mari showed us, uh, for them, most fuels go into the kiln as they are. So that we see is an interesting market due to high volumes, but uh, also a little bit difficult to find an opening where we would fit with our offerings. But in steel industry, we see that uh, gasified biofuels and also waste can be used in places where flame type of uh, energy is useful. Not maybe in the converters and those, but uh, more like uh, after processing of the steel products and just to make heat. And uh, what uh, use of gasifier requires is typically our gasifiers are, well, in respect of the other presentations here, they are not so large, but in the uh, field of gasification, we are pretty large units. We have from 30 to 200 megawatts is the range that we are comfortable to make unit size. And uh, fuel, biomass, sorted waste are the preferred ones. And also there is some sort of compatibility with the process where we are getting involved is required. CFP gasifier is uh, typically a machine that requires to work long periods of time, not being shut off and on constantly. And uh, then it should be able, to, uh, 
process served process should be able to receive hot and non pressurized gases so kind of flame is what we are selling for use cement kills would be obvious application but after mr mari's presentation i would say that uh, it is a tough place to fit into but we are very interested in that area too and uh, to have it short i'm always interested in answering questions now and also later if there are some common interests with the audience yeah thank you very much veda and also your uh, your voice worked well so we we uh, we had a good uh, sound and i have uh, two questions in the chat uh, um one is why is the uh, biomass syn gas not proper for another process than combustion? Is it linked to its pollution? And also the second question is about the uh, uh, moisture of the fuel which is uh, required for the gasifier. So first question, syn gas quality, second question, biomass quality. Uh, just touch a second, I will. Uh... From CFP gasifier, the most limiting factor is that uh, the gas heating value is low. And secondly, there's a large source of inert gases like uh, water vapor and nitrogen and CO2 in it. So mm -hmm. there are very many processes where it's not fit to. And secondly, for gasifier itself, we can gasify if required down to or up to 55% of moisture, the typical Scandinavian biomass, but the gas would not have much use after that. So for example, lime kiln applications, we are playing around uh, five to 8% of moisture. And uh, then we are able to produce burnt lime. Okay. Thank you for this uh, clarification. And you also mentioned quite well how the synergies between those technologies and, for example, cement industry can look like. Also, here we have an additional question in the chat, but with uh, looking at the time, I would like to um, introduce our final uh, presentation and our final presenter. This is uh, Daniela. Uh, can I can I join because uh, we have a poll also ready. Okay, sorry, for so, sorry for this. Right, Look, thank you. So we'll see the results of the previous poll, which was uh, which was still open during the past presentations. So the most important co-benefits for industry. Uh, actually, uh, you found many of those uh, arguments pretty important but what comes out uh, slightly better here is this creating additional value from utilization of, of captured bio-based carbon so uh, that stands out a little bit but uh, i realize that the other are also uh, almost equally important so uh, that's that's pretty good input also for us um I'd like to go to the last poll where you can choose uh, which is more about uh, decision taking. So if you want to change the fuel from fossil fuels to biomass at a certain plants, so it's, it's kind of an industry decision. Uh, what's the main arguments to do that? So what, what, what's it mainly influenced by? Uh, you have uh, access to regional biomass, you have the, the technology of the plant or, or the political framework in the country, the size of the plant or the carbon footprint of the plant, so uh, to, to reduce the greenhouse gas emissions. I think you can choose uh, a few of those again, but uh, so pick your highest uh, priorities and then uh, we will see what comes out. Uh, I will leave this open again for the next presentation and then we will come back uh, with the start of the Q&A session to show uh, the results at that time. Yeah, thank you very much, Luke, and also sorry for uh, overseeing this uh, no slide here.
we come to the last uh, pre presentation now, and this is from Do Keyung. From he's a senior bioenergy advisor at the China National Renewable Energy Center, the CNREC. And he will give us a uh, presentation on China national, uh, on biomass in the Chinese industry. And uh, do we are really uh, keen on hearing from CIS Insights now. So looking forward for your presentation. Thank you. Uh, hello, everyone. Hello, we see you and we okay. also have your screen. Thank you. Uh, uh, I'm very glad that the organizer Bioenergy uh, gave me this opportunity to share with you the development uh, of uh, Bioenergy in China. Uh, I've divided uh, my talk into five parts. Uh, I will introduce the current background first. The Chinese government is actively promoting environmental governance and uh, respond to climate change with the goal of building a beautiful China. On 22nd September, in a statement to the United Nations General Assembly, President Xi Jinping states that uh, China aims to peak CO2 emission by 2030 and uh, to reach carbon neutrality by 2060. Uh, that means clean energy, including bioenergy, will play a bigger role in China effort to reduce emission. Uh, let's take a brief, a brief overview of the current state of bioenergy in China. Uh, bioenergy currently only cover 1.2% of the total energy consumption. Potential is uh, uh, for 160 million tons of uh, co equivalent, uh, but only uh, 57 million TCE are used. Agricultural residue and uh, forestry residues are the predominant uh, feedstock used so far. Meanwhile, uh, we are actively developing biomass in biomass heating and uh, other bioenergy utilization in no electrical fields. Animal waste and uh, MSW are also being used on a uh, large scale. Uh, as of uh, 2019, about 23.7 uh, uh, gigawatt of biomass power was installed. It generates more than 110 billion kilowatt hour of electricity and 20 million tons of wood pellets production capacity. Biomass in production uh, was about uh, 200 million cubic meter and the total production of biofuel was about uh, for a million uh, tons. Next, uh, uh, let's see the utilization of uh, biomass in industry. Uh, let's start with a brief overview of China's steel industry. China produ uh, produced about 1 billion uh, tons of crude steel in 2019, accounting for 53% of global steel uh, production. Its carbon emission will account for about 14% uh, of China's total carbon emission. Last year, uh, carbon emission, uh, uh, total carbon emission, uh, uh, approximately a 10 billion ton uh, in China. Chinese steel making is mainly based on the converter process. Uh, you can see the uh, you can see the uh, mainly CO two emission by the converter steel making and electric furnace. Uh, that's a, a converter steel making a very high uh, CO two emissions than the electric furnace. Uh, in addition uh, to electric energy biomass boiler with a high temperature and a high pressure steam can be widely used in steel industry and uh, the smelting industry. Uh, this is uh, 
chi uh, Chinese uh, industrial heating uh, total capacity uh, was uh, 3.5 million uh, megawatts. Uh, you can see this picture is the biomass heating, only biomass heating, uh, only account for the uh, less than um, one percent of the uh, total industry boiler uh, boiler heating. Uh, obviously, uh, replacing fossil fuels such as coke, coal, powder, natural gas, and oil in the uh, steel making process with biomass is a feasible way to uh, directly reduce or uh, even negative emission. At present, biomass as an alternative fuel, alternative fuel has not been used in large scale steel production, but small and medium sized steel plants started using biomass as alternative fuel as early as 10 years ago. Uh, you can see uh, this, uh, this case is uh, uh, in the uh, Guangdong province, uh, the technology is two stage continuous steel heating uh, furnace with the heavy oil was changed to biomass gas and uh, gasifer was selected as CBF. In May uh, 2010, the project was put into operation. It mainly provides the heat source for steel rolling. The heating temperature is between, uh, it's higher than the 1,000 uh, Celsius. And uh, back to the, this, uh, this case, uh, this uh, two case is uh, successful of biomass uh, application in industry, such as gasification of plant re uh, residue to produce steam in traditional Chinese medicine factory, uh, steam uh, production and uh, uh, biochar production from um, bamboo uh, cheap gasification. Uh, bamboo cheap are uh, vapor, uh, vaporized uh, to produce steam and uh, biochar. Biomass replaces heavy oil in uh, aluminum mm, uh, smelter and paper industry as well. Uh, there are obstacles and challenges, of course. The utilization rate of raw material collection need to be improved. A uh, lot of straw is uh, returning or burned in the field. Straw as feed or fertilizer Price are more competitive forestry residue steel collection difficult. Uh, considering the economic scale of raw material collection and uh, the matching of biomass heating projects, it is difficult for uh, intensive industry to completely adopt bioenergy as an alternative fuel. Biomass products are still at a high cost in the uh, near and the medium term such as the biomassing and the hydrogen. The amount of bioenergy replacing fossil fuel energy is limited. According to our prediction of biomass resource development in China, total uh, bioenergy utilization is, is, is expected to account for about 8% of, uh, of the total energy consumption in uh, 2050. Uh, we also note that the impact of uh, electrification on the further development of biomass is challenging that cannot be uh, ignored. Uh, finally, uh, I'd like to end my talk by summarizing the main point. Uh, carbon neutrality by 2060 is a great opportunity for the bioenergy. The demand for bio, uh, for energy conservation and emission reduction in the industry sector provides a huge market for bioenergy. Uh, assessment of biomass available need effective collection capacity are critical. The promotion of bioenergy in the industry uh, still need to strengthen the awareness of the authorities on the priority use of the bioenergy. To improve the economic competitiveness of bioenergy and evaluate the optimal scale and the technique paths, 
uh, so as to identify an effective uh, alternative model for biomass on the economic scale. We're looking forward to strengthening to the uh, research and the development of the advanced uh, biomass uh, technologies and the products. Actively explore BCCUS, uh, strengthen international cooperation and uh, contribute to, to achieve carbon uh, neutral goals. Uh, that's all, thank you. Yeah, thank you, thank you very much, though, for this very uh, interesting uh, insight into the uh, uh, ongoing activities in China. There are already many uh, questions in the question and answer um, section. Let me just pick up uh, two. Uh, one is uh, the question, uh, have you made calculation of the available biomass in China versus the required biomass uh, need for steel production? And do you have a feeling how much could you cover? Uh, now the biomass results uh, uh, developed in just uh, uh, account uh, uh, 1% uh, uh, of the total energy consumption. So that's a uh, uh, China have the big uh, uh, potential uh, potential uh, resource development. Okay. And the second question was: You showed us uh, that there was uh, where electric power in, um, installation uh, in 2019 from municipal solid waste, about 12 gigawatt. And what is the technology used in China for these installations? Uh, the installation, including uh, mainly, uh, including uh, three uh, technology. Uh, where is uh, uh, agricultural uh, forestry and agricultural residue uh, combustion. Uh, second is MSW uh, combustion for power. And uh, uh, last than, uh, third is uh, biogas. And uh, also including uh, gasification uh, to power. Okay. The main Land yeah, landfill gas. If you, yeah, landfill land, gas. Land, land gas. Okay, yeah. and then maybe a uh, one uh, yes observation from my uh, side, which made me curious. You showed that in one example, you you uh, went for wood pellets as the as a fuel in your uh, industry application, and I wonder. Um, why did you choose wood pellets? Because before we heard a lot about uh, biocarbon or going for a, um, especially cheap uh, biofuels and wood, uh, wood pellets are of course a very high quality fuel. Yeah, uh, you know, wood pellet is a oh, very high quality uh, and uh, China uh, actively uh, developing the wood pellet uh, uh, Biomass heating in the um, different varieties uh, uh, area, uh, but but uh, China, you know, the not uh, uh, more uh, more than the uh, abound abundant forest resource. Actually, the mostly the uh, agricultural residue, the forest residue, not uh, too much. So, mm -hmm. so I think. Uh, for uh, for China uh, face the obstacle or the results the issue uh, mainly is the uh, is the how to using the uh, current uh, waste from agricultural from animal waste and uh, uh, mini waste uh, uh, MSW um, solid waste. Okay, thank you. And uh, also for you, I would kindly ask you to have a look on the additional questions, because we are with the, uh, now uh, finishing the presentation part and go over to the uh, uh, overall discussion. And for this, I would like to hand over to Paul and Luke. Okay, just I would like to come back to the, uh, the Slido that we had open. Uh, so the previous slide, though, you can see it here. 
Um, 42 people have, have entered their response to the previous question. So, uh, so what's the, what is, what uh, influences the decision to, uh, to use biomass in a certain location? What clearly comes out as access to regional biomass, but also the political framework in the country. The, these are really the most important um, aspects uh, from the five that we presented here. Let me now go to the last thing, which is uh, the panel discussion. Um, we have two central questions for the panel discussion. Uh, Paul will also pick that up, I guess. So one is about what are the main challenges to use biomass in energy intensive industries? And the other question is what is needed in terms of policies uh, and market conditions to realize this decarbonization. Uh, so your input, input from the audience in Slido is welcome. Uh, I will leave this open. So you're welcome to enter your input in these two questions. Uh, meanwhile, I'll uh, give the floor to Paul. I will close this uh, close sharing, but, uh, but all your input is welcome and we can take that into account later also. Thank you very much, Luke. Um, I would like the uh, panelists to put on their cameras so we can see and we can pretend to be a real panel. And what I'm intending to do is ask exactly the same questions that have gone into Slido. Um, given the time, we might not get an opportunity to ask every panelist the same question, um, but I'll certainly pick two or three of you to ask the, say, the question and then maybe get some input from um, Luke as to what the audience are thinking. I, I think we do need to try and keep this really tight. So I would appreciate sort of very brief and precise answers um, because I noticed the number of participate participants is dropping. We, we did have 150, we've dropped to 120. And if we go beyond um, another 10 minutes, I think we could lose uh, the quorum. Um, so the first question was, um, what are the main challenges to use biomass in energy intensive industries? Um, and let me pick on you yeah, to, uh, to ask, answer that one first. Uh, me, Juha yeah. Hakala. Uh, that's uh, uh, the main challenge is, I think, especially uh, is, is the harvesting of the biomass. So we, we would need to find uh, good uh, sources, like centralized sources, for example, bio refinery or sawmill or why not bioethanol plant having a hydrolysis lignin. So uh, that is, and also uh, related to biocarbon, it's also, there should be a, a, a demand for, for this uh, biocarbon first, so that we would be able to have the operators that would be uh, interested of producing uh, higher amounts of biocarbon than today. Okay, so very much uh, an ava availability of biomass sort of issue. Um, Vim, what do you think? I agree to that. Um, uh, maybe to add on, um, for example, steel making, uh, the project we are doing, we're only estimating to go to 5-10% replacement of our uh, PCI, and we will already need more than 100,000 tons of the waste wood available. Maybe we could consider I will transport it from a region where there is a lot available, but then we think the sustainability aspect of it is lost a bit. Eh? So we really believe you have to go to local sourcing. And if you are in, in regions where you not have a lot of availability, then you, uh, you run into difficulties. So as a solution to that, we are exploring alternatives to the waste woods uh, and more in the direction also as SRF, RDF, plastic wastes of which there is a lot more volume available than uh, the waste wood volume. So, so Vim sort of agreed with availability of biomass being a big issue, but also touched on sustainability as being an issue. Do, do any of the other panelists think sustainability is a, a key issue here? Um, I would like to add, I mean, again, um, uh, for example, at the moment, we've got the project, we are trying, you know, to add biomass in electric arc furnace. So in most cases, we need to do some sort of pre-treatment. Uh, we need to mix biomass with other waste resources to make sure that, you know, we meet the uh, criteria that we require in uh, basically electric arc furnace. So 
um, biomass cannot be added to electric arc furnace as it is. They need to. We need to do some uh, pre-processing and pre-treatment, and um, in most cases, it can be quite, um, quite, uh, quite challenging um, in terms of because biomass cannot be added just, just as it is. Uh, so simply, they don't meet the criteria in terms of the physical property, for example, the density and the mechanical strengths, they don't, they don't meet in most cases the criteria, for example, because of the high content of the moisture, they could decompose very quickly and uh, degrade very easily. So the pretreatment um, of the biomass is another issue that at the moment we've got. Yeah. Doe, are there any other issues for you other than availability, sustainability, or quality and pretreatment? Uh, pretreatment is uh, very important, uh, the, even the technology of uh, uh, bioenergy development. Uh, like uh, a biofuel, uh, Bio, uh, bio from cellulosic, uh, biodiesel bio from uh, waste oil, from uh, uh, animal fat. Uh, but uh, how many uh, available uh, for for this? That's a very key issue, I think. Beca because okay. because the demand uh, from the market from the uh, demand side, uh, we we have the uh, big potential market uh, but uh, uh, how many available that's yeah. uh, can can support uh, the how we can we can reduce co2 uh, emission and uh, uh, related okay mm, yes. uh, Vesa, have you anything to add to those three uh, key I points would, uh, go with the uh, alliance uh, with the others uh, availability is the biggest issue and then get technology and ways to involve more difficult biomasses like agro biomasses and those which is still to come but uh, in forest biomass wood and all that i see at least from our perspective it's a path that is already already trampled quite a lot mm. okay and elliot Um, I, I, I completely agree with what has been said and for the, um, maybe more specifically for the cement industry, I would highlight the, so the availability aspect is really important, like, like you said, but, uh, even more the availability of, um, high quality, uh, good content mm. is, uh, is all the more important for the, for the cement industry, because, uh, otherwise the, the process cannot run properly. And this is where pre-treatment is also uh, really, uh, really key, uh, key for success. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Sounds like we're in violent agreement here on three key areas. Um, one being availability of biomass, one being on its sustainability, and the other piece around quality and 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 pre pre-treatment if necessary. Luke, is anything else come out of the? Um, well, it's, it's it's kind of confirming the same things and also uh, looking at at the size of the consumption of energy intensive industries which can be a bottleneck so uh, so also availability and you need a lot of resources mm. uh, which may not be available at the local scale so that's uh, so cost is coming also is also coming back uh, as as one of the big challenges uh, availability qual uh, quality requirements and and we also need new innovations uh, yeah so yeah. uh cost the big one that we we missed out on our from the panel feedback there um let's move on to the second question uh, in the interest of time um what is needed to realize decarbonization of these energy intensive industries and you know that might be new policies it could be market conditions it could be secure secure supply chains so maybe elliot i'll, I'll start with you on this one um, yes as for the use of uh as for the use of bioenergy in the cement sector um i, I could not uh, identify any um any relevant market conditions since uh, since fuels are uh, these fuels are naturally uh, getting integrated into the, the cement process uh, so far, uh, but I will I, I would like to highlight that um, uh, if we, 
if the bioenergy, I mean, if the use of waste is the only, uh, is the, I mean, the use of waste cannot be the only solution and you will, uh, you would eventually uh, resolve with, um, with uh, locked in emissions uh, if you don't have a, a, a proper um, um, broader strategy. So I think that long-term planning is, is, is really the key for uh, the decarbonization, decarbonization the decarbonization of the cement industry because since these uh these industry um i mean the, the investments are uh and the decisions are, are taken for uh um, will have an impact for in the the next um in the next 30 years so i think that long-term planning is really uh, is really the key for uh the decarbonization of these industries are, are, are there any barriers to that uh for for long-term planning well, yeah, the, the, you know, any barriers, anything that would prevent industry looking at the, the long term? Uh, I can't really identify one at present. Okay. So I'll not um, answer your question, sorry. Um, Visa, anything from you on this question? Uh, my, let's say, personal opinion, I wouldn't talk for the company now, I would say that uh, total decarbonization of all these industries requires a lot of prioritization, where to put the biomass and what qualities at what time, because I have a serious doubt that with all the fossil consumption we have going on even now, we don't have actually enough biomass for everything. So it has to be like a very large scale prioritization mm. to achieve it. And very even centralized planning. Yeah. And, uh, and is there anything we can do to overcome those concerns? Uh, I think uh, having a positive attitude towards that so the people will understand if we are really going there and we have to go of course mm. but it's okay. like more spirit building <laughs> yeah okay Sam, Sam uh, anything from you on this oh sorry yeah. I think uh, yeah um uh, in terms of uh, basically total um, uh, basically replacement, um, yeah, obviously maybe the biomass resources might not be enough to basically um, answer the need uh, that we require for energy intensive industry. But uh, there, there is always opportunity to mix biomass with other waste resources and it, it gives even more opportunity to use a wide range of biomass because it, uh, for some low quality biomass, we might have some limitation. Uh, in terms of their usage in some specific basically industry, but if we you know mix them with other waste resources that uh, we might be able to improve the quality and make them suitable um, and increase their basically usage in, 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 the, in the industry. Thank you. Um, so I, I've just captured th three things. It's the long time horizons that we need to, to be cognizant of here. We need to um, prioritize the use of biomass and also explore the use of alternative biomass and maybe even sort of look at uh, increasing biomass supplies that way. Um, Vim, you have or Do, do you have anything to add to that? Um, maybe one point uh, on, on the policy. Um, we also run into difficulties with respect to let's say the level of use of biomass as a reductant in steel making, because I um, do not know all the policies in Europe, but certainly in Belgium, uh, there is no, uh, let's say a level for what we call chemical recycling of biomass. So if we use biomass in our process, it's put on the same level as incineration. Although we consider our use being, let's say more value because you use it as a reductant. Yeah? And you, in the end, can make a chemical out of it if you capture your gases. So this is a kind of chemical recycling we, we see. And this is not yet accepted by policymakers. So there, I think, also some work could be done that um, 
the work we are all doing is it's putting more value to biomass than simply incinerating it. Thank you. You have? Uh, I have, a, a, according to the different stage of the, uh, from a global, a global side, uh, like uh, uh, European, in European have the advanced technology in the uh, steel industry, but uh, uh, for developing country like China, uh, it's not uh, uh, very advanced technology. So we need to developing up to the uh, formulator uh, call uh, responding uh, policies, uh, legal status, uh, codes, encourages uh, substitu uh, substitution, uh, substitution, uh, substitution, uh, encouraging technology upgrading, uh, tax instead, uh, incentives, and uh, so on. Thank you. And um, final comment on, for you, huh? Yeah, that's uh, also one uh, important point. Point that is 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 the is the uh, biomaterial going to be free of the emission trading also in the future. I assume so because it's uh, circulating in the atmosphere and in the, in the ground, but that is also, I think, one hot topic. Uh, don't have the answer, but that is uh, mm. uh, related to, to, to the, uh, what is giving the frames or for the operations. And just a comment on the, if there would be a large production of, of uh, biocarbon in some local area, that would affect on the uh, on the biomass price at the local level too. So there will be a, a market effect there too. And if we take the biomaterial, uh, for example, from the energy sector, uh, that should not then be substituted with fossil fuels to, to have this kind of uh, uh, carbon neutral effect on the national level or in the world level. Okay, thank you. So I've captured, as I said, stuff around the, the long-term horizons and long-term planning um, barriers, um, prioritization of biomass use, um, looking at alternative biomass sources or, or even growing more biomass. Um, and then there's a whole range of issues around policy, whether it's the ETS or emissions trading, whether it's um, clarity on biomass use into this sector or whether it's sort of country relevant policies. So um, Luke, anything worth noting out of the Slido? Yeah, well, uh, we had 17 comments here and uh, a lot of them were also on the, uh, the CO2 price. So to have a correct price on, on CO2, to have uh, to look at uh, the CO2 budget that we have for the, the targets that, that we have to aim for and, and have some kind of a general effort sharing. Um, let's see. There's also somebody talking about uh, we need a radical change of, of leading economical models uh, in society. Uh, we have to look at uh, the life cycle. So life cycle assessment in terms of greenhouse gas emissions. Um, so a lot of it is, is related to, uh, to CO2, so carbon taxes or yeah. CO2 budgets. Um, also one here on minimizing the capex and also um, liberating land use regulations to, to free up the availability of biomass, uh, I guess. Great. So that's, Great. that's the general thoughts here. Good. Okay, so we've, I think we've captured some of that information and that's extremely useful for us. Um, I think it, it's time that I draw this this to a close. Um, we're down to 90, 93 participants now, so we're, we're nearly halfway, uh, lost half of our audience. Um, I'd just l like to, to thank the um, presenters. So, Yuna, Sana, Vim, Elliot, Visa and Doe, thank you for your very interesting presentations. I also would like to thank you for your efforts in answering the um, questions during the Q&A session. I think um, we had about 32 questions and all of them have been answered. So that that's really, really good. And um, finally, I'd just like to remind everyone that the um, third session in the, this series of webinars will start at 2 p.m. Central European time. That, that's in about two hours. 
and it will focus on uh, biomass in chemical and process industries. So with that, uh, I'd say goodbye and uh, thank you for your participation. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.